This lecture is about maintaining software. Maintaining software is a different process from writing the software in the first place. You might write your student project in a few weeks or a few months, but maintenance means keeping that software alive for potentially years or even decades after it was written. How do you keep a piece of software alive when the systems that it runs upon, everything from the hardware you're running on through the operating system and the libraries that you're depending on are, are all changing over time. Slide two. We can divide the concept of software maintenance into several sub-activities. Releases, versioning, packaging, supporting users, development flows, refactoring, and community building. These are the topics that we'll be looking at in today's lecture. Slide three. What is software maintenance? Here we can see a picture of someone maintaining their motorcycle. That's made famous in the book we mentioned in our debugging lecture, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. You can see that maintenance is a different activity from riding the motorcycle. It's also a different activity from designing the motorcycle and from building the motorcycle, which are the analogous steps to most things we've seen in software creation. So maintenance is coming from the, the French word maintenant, which means now, the present time. Um, and roughly, it means something like to keep current. When you maintain a motorcycle or a piece of software, you're considering where it fits into the rest of the, the modern current world around it and making sure that it's compatible with what is going on in that world. If you're maintaining a motorcycle, you're going to be checking that its tyres are still okay, that its engine is still okay, that it's being kept up to date with any new safety features that may be required by law on motorcycles um, or by changes to traffic regulations, figuring out different ways to use the motorcycle, different ways to ride it. And it's the same with software. The environment that software is going to operate in is always changing. Both the technical stack that we sit on, but also the ways that software is used can change over time. For example, when Discord was initially created, it was supposed to be a means for gamers to coordinate their games with each other. But since then, it's gone on to become a more general remote working tool. It's had to grow new features to enable business users, for example, um, to make use of it. So typically then maintenance will have two components. One is to update software for the new environment, the new technical environment that it's running in. So every time your computer changes, your OS changes, your libraries change, um, some maintenance may be needed. And secondly, when the, the social environment around your software changes and you might need to add new features or change the behavior of the software to update for that. Slide four. By teaching you about software maintenance, I'd really like to get away from the traditional idea of the student project. You're all doing your group projects now, hopefully almost finished. You'll also be doing your individual projects next year, what, which is what this is really targeted at. Most traditional student projects are a huge waste of time and resources because they die when the project is over. You get enough credit to pass your degree, you move on, you leave your software. When I was doing this, I left my software on a, a CD-ROM, I think. Maybe nowadays you'll leave it rotting on a, a GitHub site somewhere. Um, and maybe you'll come back sometime in the future and the thing just won't operate at all because something's changed in the environment around it. So what I'd like to get away from then is that the traditional student project workflow, which looks something like this. The traditional student project begins with a blank screen 
or sometimes this is called a greenfield project. So you're you're not building on existing code. You're creating something entirely from scratch. So you're going to fill that blank screen with some code. You're going to run it. You're going to make it work probably once. Your program is going to run correctly for one day. And that's the day at the end of the project when you write your report based on that run. Maybe you give a demo to your markers and then that's the end. The software is put away. Um, probably no one will ever run it again. Um, probably no one other than you will ever run it again. Slide five. So I thought I'd do a little experiment on this. I thought I'd get out my own old undergraduate project from 20 years ago. When I was an undergraduate, I did my project on computer music in Java. This was in 1999. So I thought it would be interesting as an example of the maintenance process to explore what would be needed to make that traditional style student project come back to life again. Needless to say, it didn't run straight out of the box. So here's roughly what I did. In those days, we kept our files on CD-ROMs. Um, so initially, just getting the code onto my new machine was quite seriously non-trivial. The code was stored on an old CD-ROM in my attic. I no longer own a CD-ROM player. Not very many people do nowadays. So the first task I had was to go and find a working CD-ROM player. Um, luckily, I'd, I'd made several copies of this on several CD-ROMs. Some of those CD-ROMs were no longer working because they'd been kept in the attic for 20 years, but I had enough backups to be able to recover the code. The code for my project was stored in a bunch of zip files. A zip is a compression standard which has been around for a long time um, and luckily the zip program still worked. There are cases where code is compressed using algorithms that are no longer maintained themselves and then it can be very difficult to get them, un to get them unextracted. So to bring this code into the modern world the next thing I did was transfer all of that code onto a public git uh, website. In this case, I'm using GitHub. You can see the URL of this on the slide. If you'd like to have a look at my code, it's all public. Anyone can go in there and play around with it. So once I'd got it all under source control, the next thing to do was to try to compile. Needless to say, this did not work very well at all. This code was written in, I think, Java version 1.0 two back in 1999. Java is now on something like version 8 or 9 and there have been many changes both to the language itself um, and to many of the, the core and non-core libraries that are associated with Java. So the first thing I saw when I tried to compile in this case was there was no Java. There was no Java compiler at all installed on my computer. They used to come much more as standard. And nowadays you have to go off and find a Java compiler. The people writing Java compilers um, have created new versions, new forks of the Java system since then. Um, the latest version I can find is called OpenJDK. This is a fully open source version of Java. So there were some politics in Java. This code was, um, it was originally written on a Microsoft fork of the Java language, actually, which was called Microsoft J++ back in the day. That was controversial because it was a fork that introduced some relatively minor changes to the language. But the changes were just large enough to violate the standard. That meant code written in Microsoft J++ didn't quite compile with what was then Sun Microsystems Java compiler. So I can remember back at that time, um, I was doing graphics and making colored images as part of my project. And I remember one of these small changes was that, I think in the Microsoft version, all the color names were in capital letters. And in the Java version, they were in lowercase letters. And it was a very minor change, but it was just enough to prevent the code from running on both of those systems. 
So what we have today is yet another implementation of the Java language called OpenJDK. Um, this currently exists in at least two active forms, OpenJDK 8 and OpenJDK 9. So these OpenJDKs have introduced changes um, both to the core language um, and also to several of the libraries which I was relying on at the time. Now this was a computer music project, so it was very heavily based on the Java MIDI libraries. At the time I wrote this, the MIDI libraries were in alpha development stage, so they weren't even part of the J++ implementation of Java that I was using. It was something that I had to download separately, directly from the authors, and I remember talking to the authors um, of Java MIDI at the time to, to try and make them work um, back in 1999. So there's, there's clearly been a bunch of changes to, to these libraries, which are also calling causing compiler errors. Java has also seen big changes in its graphics API, the way we draw windows, buttons, mouse interactions, all used to be done through a system called AWT, the Advanced Window Toolkit. Um, AWT was getting a little old at the time I wrote this program. There was a new system called Swing being developed. Um, and I think I remember trying to compile the code and getting warning messages, depreciation warnings from the compiler. Not, not saying that the code was bad, but saying that one day in the near future, some microsystems would no longer be supporting the AWT graphics library. And so maybe I'd be interested in upgrading all my code to, to swing in all that spare time I had, which I didn't. I kept with AWT at the time. So AWT is now causing more severe errors. Back in the day, we were just getting warnings saying one day this stuff will be removed from the language. Now it really has been removed from the language. So you can see on the slide, um, I'm doing my GitHub properly. I've created an issues page, even though this isn't a team project so far, it's only my project. I still use the same issue based reporting that you can use in a team project. This is just for me to keep track of my own issues and be able to fix the bugs in order of priority. And here you can see a, an AWT error and some MIDI errors. So both AWT and MIDI are, are to do with libraries. The third error you see here is to do with serialization. My music program had a load and save feature and I used Java's own binary serialization to export the data. That serialization process has changed somewhere along the lines. So this was an error that came up a little later when I got the program to actually run. I fixed the problems with the other libraries, but then when I tried to load or save any data, it was incompatible with all the data files that I'd created 20 years ago. And that's because the binary serialization format has changed as different versions of Java have come and gone and different implementations have come and gone. So you can see one of the issues I've put on my GitHub here is I should update the program so it doesn't use binary serialization anymore. We should replace binary serialization with human readable text files because a human readable text file can be read by anyone in 20 years. It isn't dependent on a particular implementation of Java anymore. So I spent some time working on each of these bugs. I upgraded the graphics to a, a newer version of the graphics library, um, upgraded serialization to human readable text files. I'm still in the process of getting the actual sound working on this thing. I think I can currently play the sound back on a single channel of MIDI, but the thing is supposed to be polyphonic. So I need to figure out what's changed in the MIDI libraries um, to get my polyphony to come back again. These are all examples of very typical software maintenance processes. This is what you do when you pull out a project after 20 years and you want to make the code run on a new machine. And again, it's because the environment around it has changed. The hardware it runs on is different. The operating system it runs on is different. The language version is different and the libraries it runs on are all different. 
there could also be new use cases for the system. When I when I first wrote this, I was playing back on a standard called General MIDI, which is a very basic way of representing musical notes as used by home Yamaha keyboards for school children learning to play the piano. When you go to the full MIDI standard, full MIDI gives you much more control over the expressivity of music. Since writing this project, for example, I've got much more into analog synthesizers and I'd really love to extend the program now to be able to control those kinds of systems. Analog synthesizers have tens of knobs and every knob changes the sound. It doesn't change the pitch of the note, it doesn't change the Western music notation representation of the note, but it changes the texture of the note. Um, and all of that information could be captured by a, a program similar to the one I'd written, but it, it's not currently doing that. So as well as maintaining for technical environment changes, I'd also like to do some maintenance now to adapt to the new, in this case, musical use case environment um, to enable new features to extend in new ways. These processes have been very different from the process of designing and writing the software in the first place. I remember that being a very creative process. I remember spending a lot of time in coffee shops, drawing ideas on the backs of envelopes, um, coming up with theories of how to represent different kinds of music, how to combine music in different ways. Um, that's the creative part of, of software creation. What we have here is something that really looks much more like actual engineering. We've been talking about the difference between software engineering and more general software creation. Um, if there is a process that looks more like engineering, this is definitely it. This is definitely something which comes later than the, the creation and design process. And this is really maintenance. To be fair on professional engineers, I think most professional engineers would like to portray themselves at least as being more involved in those design and build stages. Um, real engineers do get a little offended if you refer to, say, washing machine repair technicians as engineers. Sometimes you call a, a washing machine company and they say, we'll send one of our engineers out. And the real engineers get very angry and annoyed about this. Um, but whatever this is called, this is, this is maintenance. This is looking after a piece of software. It's getting it out after a long period and making the thing work again. So, slide six. Some lessons that I have learned from my own undergraduate project and through this process of exhuming it and bringing it back to life 20 years later is that student projects can be pretty good. This was actually a, a pretty decent piece of code. It's still one of the, the coolest things I ever made. It's unusual when you're a student, you get to make something that you, you really love. You can make something beautiful that is your thing. When you graduate, even if you come back to work in academia, you will typically find yourself working on other people's projects. You're going to be a smaller cog in someone else's machine. And it's, it's still unusual to have the freedom to make something that is completely yours and completely beautiful. So I thought it was still worth getting this thing out. But what would I have done differently? If, if I could go back 20 years and tell myself how to change the way I did the development, of that project, what would I have done? How could I make a more modern student project? So some ideas I'd suggest from this experience then are don't start with a blank screen or from a green field. In those days, it was still a little harder to get involved in other people's projects. We didn't have Git back then. And to become a contributor to someone else's code, you'd have to really gain their trust and build up a personal relationship um, before you could really modify anything. Whereas today it's become much easier just to fork someone's Git project, um, work on your own version without even having to tell them about it until it's finished. So it's become much more possible nowadays to begin your student project, for example, your third year project next year, not from a blank screen, but by beginning with someone else's code. Find a project that already exists 
and see if you can extend it, see if you can keep it alive, see if you can help it to grow. Um, an advantage of doing this is that any project that you choose to get involved in is probably one that already has some kind of following in the real world. The reason you've heard of it is because other people have heard of it. And so this is a way for you to create code that will continue to live on after your project. If you contribute to an existing piece of free software, the world will download your code. When you die, people will still use your code and you will have done something useful for the world. Your code could potentially live forever, which is a beautiful thing to do. You don't have to build on other people's source codes. Alternatively, you can build on other people's libraries. So many projects are created as libraries. Instead of having a user interface, they have an application programmer interface or API, and they're designed to be incorporated into other software projects. Um, for example, so that you can call them. So I did this a little bit in my project. I was using the MIDI library. I was using the AWT graphics library. Um, nowadays, there are many, many more libraries out there, all with free software licenses, which you can build upon. So if you can find ways either to extend existing code or to combine existing library code through its APIs, if you can put all your code up on a Git website as free software, if you can attract some users, or if you contribute to a system that already has some users, then you can keep your project alive, potentially forever. When a project really comes to life, very interesting things can happen. Things can happen that are beyond your initial ideas and beyond your control. So you may start to see as your user base increases, you will see users will give you more and more detailed bug reports and they'll start to investigate the causes of those bug reports. And some of those users will then transition to become developers. There's a very grey boundary between a bug report and a technical fix. If you understand the bug in enough detail to know what it is, then you can just change a couple of letters in the code to actually patch the thing. Now you've become a developer. Some projects can evolve or fork and just turn into completely other things. This was a music project. It was designed with Western music notation. But if this thing comes alive again and gets other people involved, you know, maybe you would have musicians from other traditions coming in. You might have electronic musicians into synthesis and MIDI parameters who want to take it in that direction. You might have musicians from other cultures. So for example, Indian music has an entirely different way of understanding the relationship between notes and the, the notion of what is a composition. And those, those ideas could be brought in to change the, the fundamental design of the project. If you can do this, you have a chance to really do something useful for the world. Your project won't just die when you get your exam credit. The thing will live on potentially for longer than you. Many of the creators of the, the first phases of free software are now dead but their software is still alive and it will live forever but in the meantime you can enjoy basking in the light of your project perhaps you'll become famous at least you'll become respected it's common now that many of the best jobs at the top companies are not advertised at all they just look for the authors the top projects. They call the people who are famous and respected and just invite them to come and join their company. Maybe you could become one of them. Slide seven. <coughs> Slide seven. Why is software maintenance needed? The analogy with motorcycles and other physical goods is somewhat stretched because unlike physical goods, code doesn't actually rot. If you lock a motorcycle in a shed for 20 years, you might expect parts of it to rust or otherwise degrade. Digital code as a digital entity does not physically rot over time. The physical medium that it lives on could rot. Your CD-ROMs in your attic could rot away. Or if you store them on a remote Git server whose company goes out of business and 
destroys its infrastructure, it could rot away. But the digital symbols themselves can never rot. Digital symbols exist in a different mathematical reality to physical objects. But we do have a concept of code rot or bit rot, sometimes used a little tongue in cheek. But it's a serious effect. Your, your code will cease to work over time. And this is because modern code doesn't run in isolation. Modern code always runs as part of a community, both of people and of systems. That can include, but is not limited to, changes in your operating system. Your operating system presents a large API. That's all the library functions that a user can call to access the functionality of the OS. Operating systems are constantly evolving. People propose new functions and crucially remove old functions all the time. And your code has to keep up with that. If you write your code using some specialist function inside of Linux and 20 years later the Linux developers decide to remove it, then your code doesn't work anymore. So at a higher level, software libraries are going through a similar process. Every software library has an API. That API is created by the library maintainers and they try and make the most beautiful design they can for their API. And these ideas of, of beauty will change over time. Often you'll only discover a new way of designing an API after you've already built and released and got feedback on the first version. So by the time the first version goes out there, people are using it, they start to send in their complaints, and those complaints contain the ideas for how to make it all much more beautiful and elegant in the next version. So this leads to a classic problem. You'll often see APIs supporting multiple versions of themselves. So, for example, OpenCL is a parallel computing library, and I think that currently supports three different versions of its own API in the same C++ header file for this reason. Not only the libraries, but the languages themselves change over time. Python has been notorious for its move from version 2 to version 3, which has broken compatibility with much of the old Python 2 ways of writing code. So as of this month, I think, Python 2 is no longer supported. We're going to have to maintain all of that code if we want to keep it alive. We're going to have to port it all to be compatible with Python 3. The C family of languages has gone through a very long evolution. C is a little different from Python in that they, they care much more about the back compatibility. So C will introduce a different set of problems where the language becomes more and more complex every time a release comes out. One of our previous speakers described C++ as symbol, plus plus, as meaning every time you look at it, it grows. C++ gets incremented in every version, rather than by removing old features. So for example, the C++ 20 standard is going to bring in a module system. This is going to remove the need for header files at long last. However, header files will also continue to exist alongside modules, at least for the foreseeable future. This is to deliberately avoid breaking compatibility with all the code. But if you're writing loads of new code in C++ and it's all based on modules, you might very well want to be updating all your old code to also use modules at the very least, so there's less stuff for you have to think about while you're doing your development work. Formats of data and communications will change over time. Different file formats come in and out of fashion. The GIF format used to be very popular. Now everyone uses PNGs, for example, for images. MP3 audio is being replaced by OGG. Some of these changes are driven by legal issues. Sometimes companies will assert patents on file formats and cause trouble for other people using them. Sometimes technical standards will improve 
So in media codecs in particular, we always see a drive to more and more efficient forms of information compression in those codecs. Um, as with everything, developers of the latest versions of things will tend to neglect older versions of these standards. If everyone gets excited by the new OG thing, um, everyone is going off with MP3 and forgetting about how that stuff works, you will tend to find that more modern software will neglect those older protocols. So when you update your software, you're going to have to decide, am I going to keep on using the old protocols, even though everyone else's versions of them is getting a bit broken, or should I update to use the new WSI thing? Then we have the hardware side. Computer hardware is always changing. CPUs are always changing. Everything we learn about in computer architecture is always changing. The folks who write the drivers for this hardware will often endeavor to retain back compatibility. A device driver will have an API like any kind of software library. Um, but as with everything else, different features go in and out of fashion. If a hardware feature is not being used for a long time, the driver creators will probably stop supporting it as much and eventually it will fade away and die. And if your code is relying on it and you come back 20 years later, you might find that the writers of those device drivers are no longer supporting it. Build systems are often neglected in academic computer science, but they're important. My project was written in Microsoft Visual J++ of all things. Um, I could no longer find any support for this anywhere at all. So to get my code to build, I had to completely redesign the build system. So when I moved my code to GitHub, I've now shifted everything to using make files. This is Java with make files. There are also much more sophisticated Java build systems like Ant and Maven. Now, um, I decided to do it the simple way with make file. Probably if the software gets maintained much more and goes to a larger community, we'll have to update the build system again to Ant or Maven or one of those things. And then finally, social conventions are not to be overlooked. Just like spoken language, computer languages have fashions, trends, conventions between the humans who speak them. I was surprised in my Java code to find that I put all the curly brackets on the same lines as the commands they were associated with. Other communities prefer to start their curly brackets on a new line, and if you want to work with those people, then you have to adopt their standards, or everyone will just get very confused indeed. So, non-maintained code will die. This is a certainty. You cannot write your code and just leave it there and expect it to run in 20 years time. Maintaining code is a very different process to the initial design and programming. It's the difference between designing a motorcycle or riding it and maintaining it, stripping the motorcycle down, cleaning all the parts, making sure you have the latest versions of everything and putting it back together. Some people enjoy that process. Motorcycle maintenance is a hobby for a lot of people. Other people don't enjoy the process. Some people would rather be artists and creators and leave the maintenance to other people. Slide eight. Let's consider maintenance in the context of the software creation flow or cycle. This slide shows the traditional and wrong view of software development. This is what was often taught in academic software engineering before all the changes we've discussed in this module took place. In the traditional view of the software process, often known as the waterfall model, there's a distinct sequence of steps and you start at the beginning and you work through to the end. So traditionally, you come up with a concept that could be you and your friend in the pub, brainstorming ideas, writing on the backs of envelopes. Then you go and get it funded. You talk to a, a venture capitalist, you show them your back of envelope and they give you some money. Then you're supposed to go away and do the design phase without writing any software. You're somehow going to design the whole piece of software without actually writing any of it. Then you go away and implement it. 
So you take those designs and you turn them into code, which magically works. Then you test it and you send it to a QA team. And they take your fully finished and working code and they just run it through some additional tests and look for any weird special cases where, where things need improvement. At that point, you would release it. Or in those days, you would ship it, which would mean physically putting it on a ship in some cases. So you would print your software onto physical media like CD-ROMs. You would wrap the CD-ROMs in cardboard packets with the name of your product on it. You would shrink wrap those in plastic and then you'd put them on boats and vans and send them around the country. And at that point there was a distinct moment where the software went from being in development to being released. So it would be a very expensive error if something was wrong with the software that you'd made into a million CDs and put on boats. It would be non-trivial to update that software. But still that's what happened. There was bugs in the software after release and so systems were then patched. You would then listen to what your users were telling you and you'd release patches based upon them. And in later years, the patches could be sent out over the internet. When it started, a patch was maybe something you had to send out on another CD in another shrink-wrapped package on another boat at great expense. Even worse if you're selling hardware. If you find a bug in your CPU and you have to patch that bug, now you're going to have to recall all your systems and install a new chip in all of them. So after your basic patches have gone out, the software is then finished. And if everything worked out, then maybe your funders will give you some more money to build something else. Maybe version 2 of the system or maybe a, a completely new system. But this was a model based on publishing books or publishing paintings, where there's a moment where the thing is finished. It goes from being in development to being released into the world. Slide nine. The cycle that we use today is not like that. It's a much more agile and iterative cycle. We don't start at the beginning and work through and release and go home. We have a continuous ongoing process. So typically today, we might even get the funding before we do anything else nowadays. Many venture capitalists will invest in groups of interesting people rather than in their particular interesting idea. If you find a bunch of machine learning geniuses, for example, you just snap them up and give them some money. And that's the point they can go off and start brainstorming about what they might want their product idea to be. So... We're going to set up our team with some funding initially. And right from the start, we are going to begin writing code. We might not even start with a blank screen, even at the beginning of this process. We might be picking up someone else's existing code. We might be building on open source projects, on free software. We might be building on code that we've built several years ago for other purposes. But right from the team's first meeting, they're going to sit down and they're going to write some code and they're going to make sure that that code actually works. This could be as simple as just printing a Hello World program, but we don't go off and design everything on paper first. We prioritize working code at all times. So every time we go around this, this process, we're going to change the code. So there's roughly three ways in which the code could change. One is to improve the concept. So if we suddenly decide our system is no longer for music tracking, but is actually for selling dog food over the internet, the concept has changed. We're going to update the code to reflect the new concept. Or we can keep the concept fixed and we can improve the design of the code. So here we're still trying to deliver the same interface to the users, but we've got a, an idea for how to make things more beautiful inside. Um, so this is often known as refactoring. This is where we change the overall design in response to what we've been learning. Now this is very different from the traditional view. In the traditional view, there's only ever one design that is drawn with a, a pen before you write the code, and then the design is fixed. But in a modern cycle, the entire design can be shifted during 
the development process. And the third reason we might want to change the, co the code, of course, is to fix bugs. This, these might be killer bugs that are preventing things from compiling, but they could also be bugs reported by users, things that are currently out there and things you're, you're learning to improve as you go along. So to, main, to maintain sanity during this process, we are much more focused on unit tests than we used to be. We no longer have a dedicated QA department who's going to test our work when it's finished. In some cases, we're even going to write the unit test before we write any code at all. That's called test-driven development. So we do have some quality control, but it's quality control that exists within this development cycle. Now, every time we update the code, which is probably every day, at least, maybe even more often, we are going to check that the new code passes the unit test. And we're not going to accept it until it does pass those tests. So no one's allowed to commit code if it fails an existing unit test. We have to keep those tests up to date. We have to write new tests every time a new feature is added. After we've passed the tests, we'll then push everything ideally onto a, a public server. And at this point, the code is out there. Whatever we've just changed is now available both for people to use and ideally for other people to inspect and to contribute and to send us pull requests from. So the result of that is that there's going to be further issues coming in initially from users. And again, we expect some portion of those users to start filing more and more detailed bug and issue reports. And those bug and issue reports have a tendency to get so detailed that they become bug fixes. And eventually those people will start sending actual pull requests to fix the code for us. Um, that's when they stop just being a user and become a developer. So inherent in this cycle now is the fact that people outside our team can be contributing to the project. We don't just lock ourselves in a room for six months, build a thing, release it, and then wait for the public reaction we're going to be much more integrated with our users and our external developers so collaborating with people outside our team has been a big change to this part of the process and this is an iterative process so every time we hear back from our users and developers we go around again you know, this could involve going back to get some more funding to keep the thing going it could go go back to writing the new code but we're going to have this tight, agile development cycle. Slide 10. Maintaining compatibility. So, how do we maintain compatibility in a world where we are using a modern development cycle rather than a traditional development flow? In a modern development cycle, we are constantly creating new releases. Every day we're pushing a new version of the code onto our public servers and people are downloading it and using it. What are the changes in the code that we're pushing there every day? Each new release could do several things. It could fix things. It could be responding to bug reports and making the code better and more reliable. Or it could be doing the opposite of that, which is adding new features. These features might be suggested by the users. They might be suggested by the developers. Every time you add a new feature, you introduce a whole new load of bugs. Unless you're a, a magical coder who can just write new code without bugs. So at that point, the software becomes less reliable. That's the opposite objective to fixing things. So. We might also write code to tidy things. In particular, we might be removing features. There will be fewer bugs in a piece of code if we make the code as simple as possible. We only want to provide the features that are actually needed. Now, this is a completely opposing objective to another objective of maintaining compatibility. If we have 10 million users who are all using version one of the API we provide, and then we decide we're going to retire that API and replace it with our new, beautiful, elegant 2.0, um, then we might have a lot of unhappy users. 
So each new release may break things. It may break things because we're adding features or because we're removing features or even when we're trying to fix things. It's very common to introduce a new bug during the process of fixing an old bug. Now, how do our users handle this? Our users are then faced with every day there is a new version of our software out there. Which version of our software should they actually use? Just like you are using other people's platforms and libraries to build upon, your users are relying on your code. They're relying on the API that you present and they're going to build their systems based on your releases. And they need confidence that features aren't just going to disappear in the middle of the night. How can they write their code if your API is constantly shifting around? So one strategy users will take, and which you can take when you're acting as a user of other people's code, is to be very conservative. You can fix on the old version of the code that you know that it works, you're confident with it, and you just never upgrade. You know the thing works, keep it there, get on with your life, get on with your coding. So the problem with this is that everyone exists in a hierarchy now. Your users are building systems for other people to use. So your users have users and they will build their APIs on their systems and so on. You'll have users of users of users. And if everyone is completely conservative, then no new version of the system will ever actually get out there at all. This does happen. There are especially military systems out there with versions of code going right back to the 1960s because nobody wants to change anything. Everything has been so well tested and people are so confident in it. These are things like nuclear missile launch systems. There's been very little incentive to upgrade anything until a real crisis comes along and has to shift the whole stack. What you'll find as a result of this is that different users will pick up different versions of the systems depending on when they came in to your code and started using it. If you go and download a, a library today, you'll probably pull the, the latest version from their Git. But if you downloaded it five years ago, you're quite probably still using the version from five years ago. So now we have multiple versions of the code out in the wild and all of these users will be sending you bug reports asking for help, all referring to different versions of the code. Some of the bugs those users report will already have been fixed because they're still using an old version of the system. So this gives the question of which versions do you actually support? Are you going to ignore some of these users? Are you just going to send them a mail saying that bug was already fixed? Are you even going to bother saying that? Are you just going to say you're using an unsupported version of the software? Slide 11. To solve these problems of maintaining compatibility, several strategies have been suggested. The main one we see is the notion of differentiating a supported release from the other releases. In a supported re release structure, we're going to pick some release versions and make special promises about them. We might be releasing a new version of the software on Git every day or several times a day. But we might, for example, say only the version released on the 1st of April and the 1st of October every year are going to have this special status. So this is done, for example, by Ubuntu in exactly those months. So under a supported release structure, we're going to make special promises about these special releases. And those promises will last usually for a fixed time, often for four years. That's called the support period. You could try and make these promises lasting forever, but it's unclear how anyone could actually honour them. So when you make a support promise, you're going to promise that the interface provided by the software will not change. So even if you create a new implementation of the software, even if you completely redesign it, if you do refactoring, you're going to make sure that anyone who builds on that version of your software is going to have a consistent API. So they won't have to care what you're doing underneath. That means anything that can be seen by your user has to be held constant. So that includes things like function headers or interfaces 
if you're not using C. It includes things like data definitions, data structures that are user facing. Or if you're building an end user application, this could include things like the structure of the graphical user interface. You're going to promise not to move the icons around if your users invest years of their time in training staff to use icons in particular places. So this means that your software will work on later versions of their dependencies. This means you're going to continue to maintain these versions of the software even as your dependencies are shifting and changing. So for example, you could be providing a library, say you've written a numerical matrix library for Python. You're going to promise to keep this code alive for four years. You're going to promise your API doesn't shift. But if someone changes their library that you are relying on, you're also promising you're going to take account of that and keep your system up to date. In particular, this is relevant to security. Many libraries and other dependencies like operating systems will have security flaws discovered during the lifetime of your software. And at that point, it would be unethical for you to claim your system is supported if there is now a known security vulnerability inside of it. So you're now taking on your side of the bargain. You're going to be spending the next four years watching out for all of your dependencies and making sure your code is maintained with respect to them, especially for security updates. There can also be updates of dependencies that just make them nicer. Maybe one of the libraries you're using now has a new API. Maybe it has a new WYSI, beautiful, elegant design. Um, you may wish to maintain your version of the code to stay up to date with those. In particular, if you don't do that, you're going to have a hard time hiring developers to work on this because developers always want to work with the latest, most beautiful, elegant release. It's harder to find developers who are happy to work off old, ugly, outdate, non-CV enhancing versions of libraries. Or you might even decide to completely gut your implementation. As, as long as you keep the API the same, there, there may be entirely replacement versions of libraries coming online. And you might just chuck out a whole bunch of your dependencies and replace them with entirely different ones. As long as you keep your API the same, so your users don't care, that's the promise you're going to make in a supported release. Slide 12. How do we distribute software today? When I got into this, there was still physical media distribution. That meant your software had this notion of being finished on a particular day. It would then get copied onto tapes or discs or CD-ROMs. Um, a little after that, we started to distribute over the internet. We would often create what is called a tarball. That means you join all your files together to make a big file. You probably compress it as well. Um, and you make that file downloadable and you call that a release. So you'll often see .tar.gz on the end of a file name. The tar refers to multiple files getting tarred together or made into a single big file. And the gz um, is a zip style compression algorithm that reduces the download size, which used to be a lot more important than it is now. Now, when people were doing tarballs, they continued with the mindset of the tapes and discs people. They still had the mindset that today we are making the release. We're going to go through this process of making the tarball, which requires some effort, like shrink wrapping a physical CD-ROM. Um, and we're going to distribute it, and that's the version. Maybe that's the version we'll continue to support for, for some time. Since then, we've seen other ways of distributing software. So we will often see the notion of a package today. So a package is somewhat similar to a tarball. may actually be distributed in the form of a tarball. But a package also has semantics about the environment it's going to run in. You might have an operating systems package, like we saw in Debian, where as well as containing the bunch of files needed to run your code, a package will also contain information about its dependencies. What is the environment it needs to run in? 
So you might download a, a drawing program as a package. And the package will have information that says, I promise I will run, but only if these three other image processing libraries are available with certain versions and presenting certain APIs to me. The most recent way of doing this is now what we see as continuous software updates. So when you turn on your PC tomorrow, you'll probably have a bunch of annoying update messages saying, please can I update my graphics processing software? So what we're seeing here is software that updates itself. There isn't really that notion of the, the big release, the big tarball or the big package anymore. This is software which every time a new version comes along, it will automatically call home over the internet and download the latest version. When we look inside a package, we will typically see a small collection of files of standardized types and standard names. So we'll often see packages which contain executable machine code. This is different from a source package that only contains the program. This is software that has been compiled and it's been compiled only for a specific machine. So if you need to install software from one of these packages, you need to make sure you have the right version. For example, if you're running an AMD 64 CPU, then you must have the right package to run on that particular CPU. Executable packages are nice because they're already compiled. They're very quick to download and run. Therefore, you don't have to do any of the compilation work on your own machine. And because they're specialized for a single CPU type, you can compile in all the dependencies, all the other libraries that are needed into a single chunk of machine code that behaves a little like a, an old fashioned CD-ROM and, and just works. In other cases, you'll download a package containing the source code. Now, distributing your work as source has advantages and disadvantages. So advantages are, especially if you're doing free software, that's part of your ethics, that you want your source to be available. But distributing source will also encourage your users to turn into developers, because whenever they see a bug, it's much easier for them just to drop into the source and see what's going on and fix it and send you a pull request. The downside of distributing source is that now your users have to compile the thing themselves. And every user has a slightly different machine. That's not just the hardware, it's not even just the operating system, it's everything on their machine. A typical computer has thousands of libraries on it, and every library has a, a version number. And your software needs to decide which of those versions of all of its dependencies it's actually going to run on. Now, there are ways to do this by giving numerical version numbers to everyone's libraries, everyone's dependencies. And if everyone follows those rules, then it should, in theory, be straightforward to figure out what's going to run on what. But it relies on everyone keeping their promises. If you promise to support an API for some set of versions, then the support has to be there for other people's code to build upon. So some packages will solve this problem by including versions of their own dependencies inside them. If you don't want to depend on your user having version 3.7 of the image library, or if you're not sure if version 3.7 or 3.6 is going to be compatible, you can just include the entire library in its entirety inside your package. That means that all your users who install will have the specific version that you have tested on and you really know the thing's going to work. The downside of that is that if your user downloads a hundred different packages, they might now end up with a hundred different versions of that library. That's inefficient. It's going to take up space on their hard disk. It's going to take up time for them to download it. And it can cause other problems down the line when the next piece of software comes along and decides to look for that library and now there's a hundred different versions, all with differently trustable sources and differently trustable securities of their sources. So most packaging systems now will not distribute the whole dependency with them, but they will instead contain information about what those dependencies are and how to automatically download them. So if you use a package manager program like apt on the Debian based system, 
app will scan the package it will say what are the dependencies it knows what the version numbers of those dependencies are and it knows how to automatically connect to the internet to download all the dependencies and make sure the right versions are in place but we can see packaging and releasing and support as an example of the medium is the message the way that software distribution technology has changed from the time of tapes and cds through internet distribution through to continuous updating it's actually changed how the development process itself is going to work it means we can be much more responsive we don't have this notion of doing a big release every three years and waiting for feedback from users we can make that cycle go around perhaps multiple times every day to make a more efficient agile process slide 13 software distributions so far we've talked about how to distribute a single program this is a piece of software that you have written it depends on a bunch of other people's pieces of software people are going to depend on you but you're only distributing that one package that you have made the concept of a distribution is that of a set of software packages that is all mutually compatible so in the case of a system like debian you've got probably tens of thousands of software packages and they all have to be compatible with one another now this is difficult to achieve because each package is being maintained by different people and everyone is updating their systems all the time some of the updates affect other people if you change your api then other people will complain if you only change your implementation then people generally won't complain people will generally want the new version of your software if it's only got a new implementation but if you change the api then you're going to have a harder time convincing them to upgrade so to deal with this problem we've evolved a convention of software numbering we will typically use what is called semantic version numbering which is a fancy name for a very simple system we give software versions with a major and a minor number for example 2.31 and the convention is that the number before the point represents the api and the number after the point represents the implementation that means if you're maintaining version 2.31 of your package if you bump it up to 232 you're only changing the implementation your users don't care your api is the same and they'll happily come and upgrade to 232 so you better keep the api the same if you accidentally change the api and only bump the minor number then you'll be in trouble if you do change the api then you have to bump the major number so in that case you'd go from 231 to 331 and this can be a big deal changes to the major version number can be extremely traumatic for the whole software community the most notorious version of this has been the shift from python 2 to python 3. this has now taken over 10 years for software stacks built on python to update themselves if your library was in python 2 a bunch of people build on you people build on them and so on and everyone in that stack has to update their code if python moves from two to three the effect of that has been a lot of people just haven't bothered a lot of people have sat on python 2 and that situation is now critical because the two versions have diverged so much that the python community has decided we really have to kill python 2 now we're going to stop supporting python 2. we are maybe going to see something similar with the ross robot operating system community this is what most academic and industrial robotics research is based upon and for a long time ross has been an extremely stable api that community is now similarly proposing a move to ross 2 and again we've got tens of thousands of people and projects who all have to decide if they're going to move to the new standard and there are people who depend on their work and on their dependencies and their dependencies the whole community has to decide as a social process if it's going to make that transition 
if you create such a mess with your API, you might lose all your users to more stable competitors. So Python's been such a mess moving from two to three that we've seen a lot of people who would have come and joined the Python community go into other communities, like the R community, for example, who seems to be much more focused on a single version of things than the Python community. What exactly is an interface? When we talk about when we change the API and the API number, what exactly does that mean? In theory, it's simple. If you change the public facing functions of your code, in some languages, these have the word public in front of them, then you're clearly changing the API. If you only change the implementation of a function, what happens inside that header or interface, um, then you shouldn't be affecting your users. But it's not actually as simple as that. In some applications, the implementation can be viewed as forming part of the interface. For example, a very common reason to change the implementation is to make code go faster. You found a more efficient algorithm, a more efficient way of doing things. So you upgrade the implementation, you keep the interface the same. But in some applications, that timing actually matters. If your user is calling your function and expecting it to take two milliseconds, and it takes five milliseconds, then you can break things, especially in an application like computer music or speech recognition, where real-time signal processing is very important. The worst case of this we've seen is the spectra and meltdown CPU bugs, which can, can be viewed as an instance of this. In these systems, the CPUs are implementing an instruction set architecture. That's an API for hardware. Two CPUs are supposed to have the same interface because they implement the same instruction set architecture, but one of them has these different timing issues from the other, and it's those timing issues in Spectra and Meltdown that are now being exploited as security for us, for hackers. So two systems which apparently present the same interface, one has a security flaw, one does not, and it's because the implementation, the timing of the implementation, is effectively something that the user can see and therefore becomes part of the interface. There are conventions around version numbers. Releasing a new major version number is a big deal. It's something most projects will only do a couple of times in their lives. And this can involve teams of thousands of people. So it's a big deal when you release a new major number. In the open source community, there's a convention, especially around release version 1.0 is a very big deal. You release version 1.0 only when you're really sure that the thing actually works. When you promise this is version 1.0, that means you're not going to be changing the API anymore for hopefully a long time. And you're telling your users, you're giving them a social signal that the thing is going to be stable. When you release 1.0, you're putting your reputation on it. You're promising the community that you're not going to change anything anymore. And if you do change things, then you're going to lose a lot of that reputation. So you'll see many, even very mature open source projects will deliberately avoid ever releasing a 1.0. They'll do version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Eventually they get up to 0 0.9 and then they'll go to 0.0. 9.1, then 0.9255, and so on. And it's it will become newsworthy. It could be headline news in the technical press when they actually decide to release 1.0. When they do that, it's a signal that you can then go and build on it and you have some confidence they're not going to mess around with the API anymore. So then there's a standing joke that release 1.0 never actually works because that's when all the users come in and then they find all the new bugs and then those bugs have to be fixed and things will get changed and the API will get changed. So there was a standing joke that it only really works when you get to version 3.1. <laughs> That's an API change of 3.0 followed by an implementation fix to get the point 0.1 when they, they fix the implementation bugs. In commercial software, you'll tend to see higher version numbers um, and they become used in some cases purely as a marketing tool. If you have two competing products, the user, a non-technical user, will often want to buy the product with the highest version number. So if you've got my music program 5.0 and your competitor's music program 6.0, all the users will go and buy 6.0 because it looks more mature. 
So you'll often see commercial version numbers getting pegged to one another. For example, systems like OSX, X standing for 10, um, and Cubase SX, the music software, where SX is short for the number 6. They're both designed to keep up with the numbers of competing products. Going back to distributions, let's take a look at some of the, the famous distributions then that are put together using packages under that semantic version numbering convention. You will see the famous open source distributions, Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, and so on. These are software distributions which contain not just operating systems, but entire tool chains needed to do useful computing work. Typically, they contain an operating system and compilers, build systems, libraries, applications. They're all bundled together into what is called a software distribution. And the concept of that distribution is that it is a highly curated selection of packages, all using those semantic version numbers. And they're all designed so that everything is compatible with everything else. So it can take many years of work to release a distribution like this. Everything must be tested with everything else. And there are many social decisions that have to be made. If you are almost about to release and now your dependency on the image library has been updated, they send you an email saying they've gone to version 7 and you are on version 6. Are you now going to rebuild your entire distribution to take account of that? Or are you going to make a cut and say, no, you were too late. We're going to carry on using version 6. So this is what differentiates the different distributions. Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, and so on, all have different policies for when they will take new versions and which groupings of packages can be put together. Over in robotics, we have the robot operating system. This is not really an operating system. It's really a piece of middleware that runs on top of a regular operating system. But ROS comes with its own packaging system now. There are tens of thousands of what we call ROS nodes um, which are getting distributed together in a similar way. In a ROS distribution, so these na have names like ROS Indigo and ROS Kinetic, we have to decide on particular versions of a bunch of ROS nodes that can all talk to each other. They all, ha all have to agree on their API versions. For example, they're agreeing on standard types of messages that can be sent between them. Things like LiDAR, odometry, joystick command messages. So a distribution doesn't just happen at the operating system level. It can occur at any point in the software stack. Slide 15. Let's talk about how these maintenance and versioning ideas play together with source control systems like Git. And how is the shift from a rare release cycle to a continuous release cycle affected the way that we do source control. So a flow is a way of using a particular tool, otherwise known as a workflow. If you take a tool like Git, you can use Git in many different ways. You can do sociology with your team and agree on certain processes and certain orders of doing things. So Git flow is a Git workflow arguably based around a, a, a slightly dated version of the release cycle. It's designed to deal with this problem of maintaining compatibility with multiple versions in the wild. And specifically, how do we keep track of fixes and issues and versions with these multiple releases in the wild? What we see in the Git flow diagram then is several branches of the project existing simultaneously. This is something you can do in your group project or even in your individual project. We are maintaining a master branch. This is the master for development. It's the latest version of the system where everything just about all works and is compatible with each other. When we want to add a new feature to our system, we don't work on it in the master branch because that could break the master branch. We want the master branch to always work. So at this point, we will go off and create a feature branch. And in the feature branch, we can work independently on our feature away from other people who have their own feature branches. 
when it's time to make a release, we will really tidy up everything in the main branch. We'll make sure it's compatible. We'll go through a distribution style process. And for a few days, we'll try and get the latest versions of everything all talking to each other. And at that point, we say, this is a release. We give it a number. This is release 1.3. Here you go, world. Off, off you go. Sometimes those releases will then have problems in the wild and we have to decide, are we going to fix them properly or are we going to patch them up? So fixing them properly means going back to the main version of the system and really fixing the underlying cause of it and keeping that change forever in new versions. Patching it up means, especially for security flaws, someone's discovered a major problem in the system, it's going to take everything down by next Thursday and we have to do something quick and dirty to make the thing work by next Wednesday, preferably. So you may do something called a hot fix, in which you're going to just patch that thing up um, and it's only going to be applied to a particular version of the release. Now that creates quite a lot of work for people because now you're supporting multiple releases, especially if you've created an official supported release with one of these promises about when you're going to look after the code. Um, you might now have to have three different technical teams whose job is to support one version of the system each when the bug report comes in. Now, slide 16 is a arguably newer and better approach to flow workflow in Git, known as GitLab flow. This comes from the website, GitLab. Um, GitLab flow has been based specifically to address those kinds of criticisms, that Git flow is too, too big and too complicated and is too fixated on fixing all the versions. So in GitLab flow, we take much more of a, a continuous integration, continuous deployment approach to things. So in CI, CD, the idea is we rely very heavily on unit tests. We make sure everything is working at all times and everything we commit that passes the test becomes part of the, the current release. And under this approach, we're more likely to require and expect our users to always keep track of the latest release. Because we're using unit tests, we're promising not to break things as much. So you can see GitLab flow is a much simpler approach. We just maintain a master branch. We maintain some feature branches and every now and again, we will spin off a release and send it out into the world. Now these releases, these, these occur, for example, when your CICD Jenkins system has checked everything, this could occur every day. There could be a new release every day. Um, you're going to throw them out into the world and you're probably not going to bother fixing them. If a user, reports a problem, you're not going to hot fix it. Instead, you're, you're, you are going to fix it, but you're going to fix it properly in the master branch and all those fixes will become part of the mainline code. So in GitLab flow, you don't spend your time providing technical support for outdated versions anymore. Okay, the last point I wanted to make, the last lesson that I've learned from updating my own piece of software maintenance from my own undergraduate project is always use human readable data. The hardest thing for me to fix in my music program was I'd done some lovely work in the program as a user 20 years ago. Um, I'd made some nice musical compositions. I'd saved them all for future use, but I'd saved them all in a binary serialized format, which I can no longer read because Java has changed and serialization has changed. So always store your data in a human readable format. This is what we've learned from decades of software practice. Don't store data in binary formats. Data format is often the very first part for code rot to set in. Your language will change the way it does serialization. Implementations of the language will do it differently. You will almost certainly want to change your binary format many times you'll decide on new features that require new ways of storing data um, and your dependencies may decide to change their formats. The people who implement the libraries reading and writing media files in particular are always shifting these formats around. 
So always use a human readable format, which can be paused and recovered by you as a human in an absolute emergency, at least by a new small program that you can write that can parse this stuff and get out the information that you need. If you're human readable, you also make it easier for other people's software to interface with you. Other people will use your software in ways that you cannot even imagine. You, they will do weird things with your, your music representations. They'll do amazing things, but they can only do that if they can interchange data with you. And again, if you have a human readable format, it enables the writers of those systems to be able to do that. So for example, you might use a, a standard human readable representation such as XML, JSON, TOML. These are all very simple human readable languages for representing hierarchical data, like the XML displayed here. The downside of these languages is they tend to be very verbose and inefficient. You can see this piece of XML, this is called Music XML, and all it does is describe this single middle C note in a piece of music. That's a lot of text to describe one note. So this is obviously inefficient both for storage and for, for real-time use. What we tend to do, as in Music XML, is we write it that way first, in the longhand way, and then if you need more efficiency, do that as a separate step. Take your human readable form and then apply compression, and apply that compression as part of your standard. So if you're going to have a mymusic.xml file, you're going to define what are the acceptable forms of compression and preferably they're going to be very, very standard things like gzip that is unlikely ever to go out of fashion and always be available. Um, and then if you really need to use compression, you can apply that standard. But at any point, you can always convert it back to being human readable again. And if you want to store this stuff for 20 years, just take the hit, buy some extra CD-ROMs and store it in human readable format. As well as the low-level format of the data, you might also consider using ontologies. Ontologies are higher-level conceptual forms of data organization. They're ways for different pieces of software and different writers of software to agree on what are the real-world objects that are actually being modeled. When you do object-oriented program, databases, XML, you always have to decide what are the objects, what are their properties, how do they interact. And if two different people have a slightly different concept of what a musical note is, so for example, for some people, a musical note might have a, uh, a frequency. For other people, they might have a pitch and a key. And those concepts are not quite compatible with each other. You can't export frequency information and have someone load it into their program that's based on pitches and keys. But if all those people have a meeting, and decide this is the music XML standard, this is what a note actually is. A note has a key and a pitch, and it does not have a frequency. If everyone signs up to that standard, again, in a social process, then you can ensure that data will be interchangeable. So you should be both human readable and preferably ontological as well. So, what have we learned about maintaining software then? We've learned that maintaining software is a different process from creating it in the first place. It's more like looking after your motorcycle in your garage rather than riding it or designing it or building it. We've seen various parts of the process. We've seen how to deal with releases, when to release, how to number releases to create versions. We've seen how to package software. We've seen how packages can be fitted together into distributions that are compatible with each other. We've talked about which versions should be given support which are official supported versions, sometimes known as, as long-term support, which versions should not be given support. We've looked at how development flows, the ways we use source control system, can feed into that process and support it. And we've generally seen a move from the traditional waterfall model of doing one step at a time and making a big release day with a party and shrink wrap software getting put on a ship We've seen a transition away from that to these more agile processes where you can release your software every day if necessary, as long as you understand the promises you're making to your users with version compatibility, semantic versioning numbering. As long as you honor those promises to your users, you can release as, as often as you like, as long as you maintain compatibility. Thank you.